He was a, a reporter for the KLIF, the old KLIF, and now is in San Antonio, still active as a result of this right here. And I'd like to introduce now as our first panelist, who has to rush from here to catch his flight back, Gary DeLong. Thank you, Jim, and I apologize, but the uh, strike, as you well know, has set everything back. They said, if you want to stay on standby, you can be ready until 8 o'clock. I said, okay. So we have to take this earlier flight. But there were four guys in those days who I counted on as sources at the police department. One was Sergeant Jerry Hensley. Two was Walter Potts of the Homicide Division, who was my confidant in homicide. And three was George Carter of the Times-Herald. And the fourth was Jim Ewell. And uh, they felt sorry for the guy who was the lone police reporter for KLIF. The old Scotchman, you know, he was named appropriately, all right. The, uh, the police reporter for KLIF News. And as you all well know, even in those days with Top 40, there was a lot of pressure to continuously report the news uh, when it happened. And uh, Jack Ruby was a hanger-on. He, he was a groupie, and Tony, Tony Zappi's going to tell you a lot more about Jack. He knew him uh, far better than most people in, San, in Dallas, but... Uh, Jack Ruby was, was kind of a nuisance guy, a little harmless creature, and hung around KLIF. He had a great friend there in Russ Knight, the weird beard. He would hang around KLIF, and uh, they'd bowl every night at the Cotton Bowling Palace out in Wood and Lemon Avenue. And Jack, for some reason, he thought we were his heroes. And he would bring us by Carousel Club passes and ask us to come to the club and everything. So uh, the day of the assassination, after I had reported the initial story and all of our people got back into the studio, uh, Gordon McClendon had sent me to the trademark, but I didn't get to go there because of the shooting. So he said, well, you know all the policemen, you know all the contacts, you're going over the police department. So all afternoon into the night, even after the arrest of Oswald and, and uh, the shooting of Tippett, I was there for many, many hours, hadn't even had a break for coffee or anything, and I was stuck in the press room. We were feeding out reports like every 10 or 15 minutes. So Jack had been coming to the KLF studios. He immediately got in his car and rushed to the KLF studios, and he still had his two poodles in the car, and in the back seat was a stack of pamphlets on H.L. Uh, Hunt's Lifeline, if you remember that old, old radio show. But he, Jack was a big uh, listener to that, that show, the H.L. Hunt show. So anyway, he just bothered everybody to death, and, and uh, people were, secretaries were thrown into reporting news, and the phone lines were, were just jammed. And so finally, to get rid of Jack, they said, Jack, Gary DeLon has been at the police department for, for eight or ten hours. He hasn't had any break. Can you take him some sandwiches? And so Jack said, yeah, yeah. So he goes somewhere and buys a sack full of sandwiches and parks his car in the lot. And a lot was made of this later when they said Jack Ruby's car was found in the parking lot with $2,008 in it. Well, Jack always had a lot of money, as Tony, I'm sure, will tell you. And he always carried a 38. But anyway, he came to the police department and not being familiar with where the press room was, it was on the third floor in those days, and when you went into the police department, you went down the stairs into the police locker room area, and then on to the, over to the right was a room about, oh, 20 by 35 or so as the lineup room. So Jack, instead of going up the stairs and into the elevator to the third floor, just inadvertently went down the steps and saw all this confusion. And I think someone mentioned earlier, I don't know if it was you or who, but they said about the, the lack of security. That, that's true. We, there was no security around the police department. And uh, you could just wander through. And so Jack, instead of coming up to the third floor to bring me the sandwiches, went into the lineup room. And later, Eva Grant, his rather eccentric sister, uh, more or less theorized that Jack, that it spawned in his mind to become the avenging angel. He wanted to be somebody. He had grown up on the west side of Chicago, as Tony will elaborate later, but he wanted to be somebody, and this was his chance. So this spawned in his mind, and instead of bringing me the sandwiches, then for, for a day and a night, it spawned in his, in his brain to do something. So that morning, and, and there was another in the JFK movie, for instance, uh, a lot was made about somebody opening the door and Jack walking through, which was hogwash. Jack simply walked down the ramp. I know because I walked down the ramp and there was no security. All the policemen, uh, everybody, Secret Service, it was a half moon shape, the cordon uh, of press and police officers. And I'd, I was looking almost across the room at Ike Pappas and Tom Pettit. I was directly across from them. 
and I was standing right next to um, Bob Jackson and Jack Beers. And uh, Bob just remembered it last night, as a matter of fact, he said, that's right, that I was standing next to him, and if I could just have a piece of that photography, I'd have been all right. But, <clears throat> <laughs> but that morning, after Jack had, had spawned this a couple of days, that morning, uh, our news director had said, Gary, you've, you've been up so long, said, we're not going to cover that. It's going to be an early morning transfer. We don't need to cover the transfer of Oswell. Well, I told my wife, I said, it was about 5.30 when I woke up. I said, I've got to go. I know, I just got a feeling, I've got to be down there. So I dressed and went to the police station. And this was the story I got from Chief Curry. I don't know if this was confirmed or elaborated, Hugh or, or Bob or Wes, but Jesse told me that he relented to the network demand to transfer Oswald at 9.30 rather than at 4.30 a.m., which was the initial time set to transfer him. And he bowed to network pressure so they could have the pool camera televise Oswald. So uh, Ruby, as I walked down the ramp, I know Ruby had got in that way because there was only one police officer directing traffic and he's looking the other way. So I just walked down there and saw these guys standing there. And about that time is when it happened. And uh, uh, then you, the rest is history. You know what happened uh, and with uh, the results and repercussions. But it didn't come out later. It was in the New York Times on a Monday morning. It said that Jack Ruby had initially gone to the police department looking for a Joe DeLong. Well, Joe Long was our news director, and they got me confused with him. And then during the appeals case, Phil Burleson called me to testify one day. And as I was sworn in, Jack yelled at me across the room. He said, Gary, I was looking for you. Where were you? And I said, Jack, you just couldn't find me. I was there. So that's how it all came about that Jack Ruby came to the police department looking for me when he first got the idea to become the avenging angel for Jackie Kennedy. And it was a great thrill for me to be a part of history, not so much that I got to cover it because I got to stand next to the guy that got to shoot it. Thank you. in the KLIF newsroom, unconfirmed reports at the moment indicate the strong possibility that Lee Harvey Oswald may have been gunned down, may have been shot by what uh, is unofficially reported to be a small elderly man with a small revolver. Uh, these are unofficial reports. We have not heard anything official yet, but unofficial word indicates that somehow in the movement from the Dallas County Jail to the Dallas County Jail, probably in the City Hall building, Lee Harvey Oswald, the accused assassin of President Kennedy, has himself been shot. This is unconfirmed. There are reports of one shot ringing out. The scene right now is one of utter confusion. We're awaiting official word within moments. Stay tuned. <laughs> Gary DeLong, who was on the scene at the moment, has come rushing in. He can't even talk now. Obviously coming. What, what happened, Gary? Glenn, as uh, Oswald was being uh, escorted to an armored truck, which was about 100 feet from the scene, Suddenly, a shot rang out from right above our heads, and about this time, Oswald grabbed his stomach and fell to the floor, and someone said, oh no, and I don't know who said it, and there was a mad scramble, and a bunch of police officers made a dash for one group of men and grab someone and about this time it was caught and down and then uh, Oswald was dragged back into the ante room off the, off the checkout desk at the Dallas City Jail in the basement that's uh, Gary Ford and Gary DeLong was on the scene at the time did you Gary did you get a chance to see the man did you see the man who I know who the man was that shot you know Harvey Oswald I think everybody does over there uh 
I don't think his name has been released, but he is a well-known Dallasite who reportedly owns a, a Dallas nightclub. He has been taken into custody, and uh, we don't know yet if this is the man or not. We are waiting to see. However, they do have this name uh, from this came in. He reportedly came in with a TV cameraman, and the shot rang out from where the cameras were were pointed toward the exit from which Oswald would would come. How many shots were there, Jerry? One shot only. Just one? Yes, one shot, and everybody started falling to the floor, and I was knocked to the ground in the mad scramble. It was pandemonium and confusion. Was anyone else wounded uh, except Oswald? Oswald was the only one that hit the floor. Where was he wounded? Did you see it here? He clutched his stomach, uh, uh, clutched his stomach, and uh, someone said he was, he was struck uh, below the heart. In the rear. Gary, we had one report that he was wounded in the right side of the face. Did you see his head? Though? I did not see his head, but uh, he but did clutch his stomach. And if only one shot was fired, it would indicate that the stomach shot could be the only one. Uh, it was possible that he fell to the, to the floor and then may have hit his head on the cement floor. He was uh, being escorted by Captain Fritz and about six other officers, one on each side, and whoever did hit him was a magnificent marksman because he clutched his stomach and uh, fell to the... Uh, and fell to the floor. And uh, the entire building was cordoned off. And uh, uh, after uh, just a few moments, after just a few moments, uh, police cordoned off the entire building. No one was permitted in or out. And about this time, uh, everybody was told to get into a certain area. And uh, they did get into the area. And uh, then... As pandemonium took place, and took place, and newsmen were running around as if uh, the world had ended, which indeed it seems to uh, have done on this weekend. Uh, things were starting to get more of order, and the Captain Fritz and the Secret Service agents and uh, several officers pushed the newsmen behind a restraining line, and from there the uh, order was restored to more of, an, of a usual rate. Lee Harvey Oswald, the accused assassin of President Kennedy, a self-admitted Marxist, a pro-Castroite communist, gunned down uh, today on the at the Dallas City Jail as he was being moved to the Dallas County Jail. Uh, one man, a small, elderly, gray-haired man in custody, and a believed to be a, a local man, a local well-known man, but his name has not yet been released. Should be. KMIF is continuing its constant coverage of the this event. Gary DeLong, who was there, is here now. Newsmen on the scene. More newsmen rushing to the scene. As soon as any official word comes, we'll have it for you immediately. Police Chief Jesse Curry has indicated he will have a statement shortly. We hope to have that as soon as possible. Lee Harvey Oswald was the only one wounded. He was taken to the emergency ward at Parkland Hospital, and he is there now, according to reports. Reports from the scene say Oswald back and forth, was back and forth as the stretcher was shoved into the ambulance. He was clutching his stomach where he was apparently wounded. The small man who was captured by police was hustled into the prison elevator and taken upstairs, a hubbub of commotion, Police officers jamming themselves into the door so they couldn't move at one time. The nation watched this shooting today. National television networks, radio networks, KLIF, in fact, an open line to the scene when it occurred. Once again, Lee Harvey Oswald, the only person wounded in today's shooting, evidently. The accused assassin, the victim, at least wounded. The local man who was captured has been identified as a well-known Dallas nightclub operator, Jack Ruby.